One thing we can be sure about is that the future of the workforce will continue to change. While we can't predict with certainty what the future will hold, our guest today will be giving us some career trends based on trend forecasting and past experience. I'm Grace Trafton of The Better Part. Stay tuned. Dr. Tracy Weiland is a prominent thought leader, global speaker, and media contributor on the impact of technology on society, work, and careers. She has authored 11 books, the latest of which is Employed for Life, 21st Century Career Trends. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you, Grace. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you again. You too. Now tell us what are the workforce trends that uh, you see in the digital world of the 21st century? Well, what I did, Grace, is I looked at what are some trends that people may not be thinking about in terms of career or job creation. And I looked at workforce trends, I looked at societal trends, and then I looked at some sector trends. And so what I, and I came up with about nine. So I th we'll see how many we can go through today. Okay. The first one in the workforce is I think 2015 is the year of the millennial. And I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, remind us what age group are the millennials? So the millennials are like, for ease, you know, 20s to late 30s. Our Generation X is sort of the 40s to early 50s. The baby boomers are sort of our 50 and, and up. So if you think about it, the baby boomers is just the, we have around 78 million baby boomers around 65 million Generation X, and around 83 millenn million millennials in the workforce, right? Or in, in the population. Mm -hmm. So the baby boomers are reaching the age 65 at a rate of about 10,000 a day, according to Pew Research. Mm. A lot of people view that as a retirement age or an age to do something else. So who's gonna fill their shoes? Generation X, likely, but it's not a very big generation. So now we have to deep, deep deeper into the organization, and that's our millennials. Millennials are smart. They're technical, and if they want to grab onto leadership, I think they should start looking in 2015. Now, in the past, many people targeted the large corporation as a career destination. Is that changing today? <laughs> you know, uh, think about it. We're living longer. We're living to about 100. Our kids are projected to live to 120. So just by that fact, you'll be working twice as long as your parents, right? You're probably working 50 to 70 years. The corporation is today really a stop, not a destination. And it could be a long stop. It could be a 20-year stop. But I encourage people, don't bank on it as your final destination. Think about how many different stops you'll have in your, in your personal career adventure. So what are some of the alternative destinations? Well, many people, actually, the projection is by 2020, at least 40% of Americans will be freelancing, working part-time, doing project work, or having what we call portfolio careers, mm -hmm. which is a collection of projects around a theme, perhaps as marketing or technology. Uh, some of us are doing that because of transitions, and some of us are doing it because it's really interesting, and it provides a lot of variety and in income. Um, others are moving on into different sectors, maybe moving out of technology, but into education or into healthcare. So there's a lot more stops uh, that we can take, but I think the point is, is you gotta plan it. Yeah, since uh, you're saying that we might be working for 50 or 60 years, that's kind of a frightening thought. Well, if you think about it, if you live to 100, you have to afford to live to 100, which means you're probably gonna think about working until you're 80, and if you start at age 20, 60 years, and uh, you know, and I have colleagues of mine who are, who are working well into their 80s and 90s. No, oh my goodness. In fact, I was at Walmart, and their oldest employee is 102. He's a oh gardener. Oh my goodness, yeah. really? Yes. And still gardening. And still gardening and loving it. That is fantastic. So, um, for decades now, there have been people resistant to the idea of automation. They're afraid that their jobs will be replaced by robots. Is that still a realistic fear? Well, I think um, first it was outsourcing, then it was robots, but robots, you got to understand, is driven by software. And the reality is, is that software is getting increasingly more intelligent. 
The good thing is, is that software is creating a lot of jobs. In, in fact, Facebook had just published a study with Deloitte that they were responsible for like 45 million jobs alone last year. Um, mm -hmm. Apple, in early days, said for every job they created, there would be seven additional jobs. So I think we need to look at technology as replacing, displacing, and creating jobs. But software is getting pretty smart. So if you think about your credit cards, you call up, or you're <coughs> shopping, or booking travel, the person on the other end is automated software. And it's intelligently routing you through the system. Um, and that has just replaced people. And it will continue to get smarter and smarter. So I think you always have to look at, can pieces of your jobs be replaced with software? But I think we need to um, do a better <coughs> job in educating the public about <clears throat> the fact that, you know, when one job may be replaced, maybe two others will appear yes. in its place. Yes, <clears throat> and I was glad that Facebook and Deloitte came out with a study. Um, Apple had published some of their global numbers as well because people don't understand that there are a lot of jobs that are created. If you think about your iPhone, you know, you need cases, uh, GPS, I industries like Uber are using that in their cars. Um, headphones, earbuds, you know, you name it, uh, apps, you know, it's just a whole industry around apps. So there's a lot of job creation and extra products and services that develop around technology. Right, and lots of people still don't understand that because I still hear very frequently about, uh, you know, the good old days when there were, you know, this kind of job or that kind of job that no longer exist. Yes, and that just signals to me that they're not transitioning. Right. You know, you really need to think about transitioning. Exactly. So what are some of the societal trends that you see right now? I think societal trends are sort of fun because they're, they're facilitated by technology. They're not created by technology. The first one is we're an on-demand society. A lot of Americans say they don't get enough sleep. They don't spend enough time with their kids. They don't take vacation. And guess what? Services, entrepreneurs, and corporations are responding. We have on-demand everything. On-demand hair. <laughs> Just do an app. On-demand food. You know, go, you know food trucks. Uh, on-demand shopping. Amazon. Think about it. Cyber Monday didn't even exist years ago. Right. So what does that mean? That to me means jobs. If you think about trying to get packages the same day or in one day delivery, you need logistics, transportation, call centers, chat rooms, customer service, marketing services. So on demand in itself is a job creator. And what does the term sharing economy mean? Yeah, we're a we commerce <clears throat> sharing economy. You know, why buy when you can share? You know, and a lot of millennials are bringing that to our attention. Why should I buy a house when maybe I could rent, rent one through Airbnb? Why should I buy a car, pay for insurance and parking and maintenance when I can use Uber or Lyft and it's very efficient? And in fact, Uber and Lyft in themselves are creating jobs because I meet so many people who are drivers and sharing their cars for extra income. So we share everything. I even share, you know, we share our clouds, but I even shared a Christmas tree this year. You did, how did you do that? There was a grove in uh, Carmel. Uh, they're also in San Jose. And uh, they bring you, they deliver to you, creating jobs, a potted Christmas tree. They tell you how to water it, because remember it's alive. Mm -hmm. And then they come back a month later and they take it back to the forest. They replant it, and you can actually order it again each year if you want. Oh, they replant it. They replant it. It's always alive. It comes in, in a pot with dirt. Mm. Uh, and it's your responsibility to keep it alive while you have it. Uh, but it's, it's, it's more green. It was expensive. I think we need more people in this industry. But I tell you, it was nice not to have to throw a, a tree out. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's a great idea. I hadn't heard <laughs> of that before. A lot of these services I read are hiring vets. Uh, because they're very knowledgeable and they're available and we need people to do things and um, they're building businesses just out of creating shareable items and this creates other jobs like we need lawyers to help us understand how to share corporate assets or we need people just to ha help us understand how to price out the models of sharing items so sharing is a is a big industry and you see that as a really big growing trend it's a trend I always encourage people we always tend to look at what are the, you know, the workforce job numbers, where are we going to go, 
look at those, look in your local area, who's hiring, obviously here it's technology, and then look at some of the trends that are being created. Uh, and what can you, can you jump in on that trend as well? Because it might be more interesting to you or different than something more traditional. Now another trend is the food industry. Uh -huh. As uh, evidenced by the proliferation of food programs on TV, uh, I watch a couple of them, <laughs> and uh, Americans just absolutely love their food. What do you see as some of the hot trends in the food industry, and how does it impact jobs? Oh, food is big, and the good thing is, is we have to eat as humans to stay alive. Absolutely. So food just keeps in reinventing itself over and over again. I have a colleague that she, she tells me every time she watches a food show, she goes out and buys all these pots, pans, and spices and ingredients that she would never have done in the past. So just there, it's creating more opportunities in, in the retail sector. But food, vegetarian, almost half of us eat a vegetarian meal at least once a week. Gluten-free, who knew? Rising 10% a year. Um, you know, organic, oh my goodness. It's like a $65 uh, billion dollar industry globally now. Who knew, right? We had farm to fork, farm, farmers markets, and now the farmers are creating restaurants. So we have all kinds of ways that people are getting in on food, whether it's developing an app, developing a, a service, developing a delivery, or you know, developing a food truck. So I think food will continue to reinvent itself. I mean, I didn't know there's like gazillion kinds of cupcakes. <laughs> and it was only vanilla and chocolate when I grew up. <laughs> right. So now I can get anything and everything. And I love to watch the food programs. I, I like to watch, um, the latest one is The Taste, <laughs> where they're having, you know, oh, I a competition. The, oh, they're yeah. so fun. Yeah. And they're, um, you actually learn a lot, and you do. I mean, I just find I you start trying different recipes and buying things that I would never thought of buying before. You know, I grew up on meat and potatoes and fast food was mm -hmm. McDonald's, and now the choices are, are endless. Yes, it's they a, are endless, and especially where we live here in Silicon Valley, there's just a proliferation of different types of ethnic restaurants, for instance. Yes, and the whole concept of order ahead. So that's combining the food with on demand. I can order ahead food, coffee, anything I want now in the Bay Area, and it'll be ready for me when I get there. So that takeout is easy, or I can just have it delivery like Munchery or Blue Apron and just have gourmet meals delivered to me to like $9.95. So is it's, that right? Yeah, so it's like I just do it on an app and I can order something. My goodness. I had not heard of that price before. Yes, and there's a new food service, Instacart, that just I just read about in San Francisco that have people who will actually do your vegetable shopping, your grocery shopping, and they're experts. They know how to pick out an avocado oh. or a pear, and that's better than I can do. Oh, absolutely. So there's just, everyone just keeps, you know, facilitating more and more opportunities with food. Now, is that expensive and expensive service? So every service has different uh, models. Some, some charge fees. Uh, so for example, Munchery has a, a, a one flat uh, delivery fee. Some, uh, some is it by cart or weight. So it just depends on, but most just ha tend to have a flat fee. Mm. Well, that's something to think about, especially for busy working people. You know, you, after working for 10 hours a day, you don't want to come home and have to slave okay. over a hot stove. Yeah, well, what's interesting about these gourmet food services is you can look, and every day they, they tap into local chefs, and they post their menu. Uh -huh. And then you go and look at the meal that you want, and you mm -hmm. can pick sides, and, and then you pick your time that you want it to arrive. And then someone shows up at your door, ding dong, and here's your hot meal. That and is... then you can just reheat it in your microwave, or it might be hot when it gets there. That's a fantastic idea. It is. Also, I've rediscovered the slow cooker in recent <laughs> months. The slow cooker and the pressure cooker. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yep, that the sounds on like demand a good food. idea. Look at that, we went out and bought them. Yes, Creating I did. Creating more. <laughs> I haven't tried the pressure cooker again. Years and years ago, I had a pressure cooker, you know, like 30 years ago. And um, something went drastically wrong, and all the beans ended up on the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I haven't tried the pressure cooker again. They, they, don't, uh, they don't explode anymore, anymore but they're, they're easier to control. But yes, I've right, I'm experience. sure. <laughs> I'm sure. But I love my new uh, slow cooker. It's, you know, it's wonderful when you come home in the evening and the, the dinner is all done. So yeah. it's a big convenience. 
like a whole chef was yes, there. And yes, left. <laughs> So what is uh, one of the job sectors that you see as an area of potential growth? You know, Grace, I'm going to say sadly, security is a safe bet. And I say sadly because it's in the news every day. Cyber security, people getting hacked, networks or data. Physical security, we have to watch our schools, but now we have to watch our waterways, our, you know, our energy sources, and, and, um, you know, and then just um, terrorism. I mean, we never had to think about terrorism right. to the extent we have to today. Right. And the job lists are quite long, very long. So, and I have many colleagues in their 40s and 50s who are transitioning, right, as one of their career stops, actually moving into some of these security jobs because they see it as an opportunity, whether it's on the physical side or protecting a plant or uh, moving into the cyber world or terrorism, there's a lot of positions there. So what can a potential person do to get into that field of work? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just refer to the two colleagues. They both approached it from different angles. They were transitioning out of previous fields, corporate jobs, and they looked and they read the news and they saw that there were many plants. One went into a nuclear plant and the other one went into physical security. And they called up the companies and said, what does it take? And the company said, actually, you just have to pass some basic tests and then we take over the training. And a lot of these uh, jobs actually offer pension and benefits that really you haven't heard of in a long time. Uh, and, and it's really a job, you know, a job for a long time. So uh, the, the hours are odd. That's the only thing they mention is you have different kinds of shifts, mm -hmm. uh, but it can be quite lucrative and quite safe. So, I, so do, do you know what uh, the tests entail? It's just, you know, literacy, reading, writing, um, you know, can you respond, and of course, background checks. Any kind of security job is going to probably have some background checks. Right, right. Military are very primed for these types of positions. Mm, very good because the uh, veterans do need the jobs, too. Yeah, and I think that anyone in the military can understand the urgency and the importance of protection. Right, You right. know, it's to a different degree, I think, than other of us can. Now, how about health care? Will there be more opportunities in this area since Americans are definitely living longer? And there's also the passage of the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. So in the Affordable Air, you know, Care Act, I think it's, you know, the confusion has created jobs. You know, we need patient advocates. We need people to help us understand insurance. We, we need tax people to help us understand how it, you know, with the implications. But on, on the aging, I think that's more interesting because we have the active aging and we have the inactive aging. The active aging want preventative health. So they might have personal trainers, go to health clubs, and even invest in wearable technology. I mean, everybody in the Bay Area is waiting for the iWatch to right. come out so we can monitor our health every second of the day. On the inactive side, well, there's some trends there, too. People don't want to go to old age homes anymore. They actually want to have in-home services, mm -hmm. on-demand health care in my home. Mm -hmm. So that means AIDS. Uh, nurses, uh, occupational therapists, people who will come and help us while we're sick or inactive at home, and even met a physician who said he's resuming house calls because of the really? demand of people wanting the doctor to come back to the home. Mm. So I think if you're in that industry, it's a building block industry, uh, but look at some of these areas that are growing, you know, so it's not the old age home anymore, it's in-home services. That opens up a lot of, lot of opportunities, even if you're a driver. You know, older people need to be able to get to healthcare appointments, mm -hmm. drivers, you know, they need assistance. Um, so there's a lot of areas there, laundry, cooking. Right, right. But unfortunately, a lot of these jobs are rather on the low paying side, isn't that right? Well, it varies, right? So you can get in with a certification, you can be a technician, and then you can grow, building block it. You can add on a year of education and then expand. You can move into IT. You can move into marketing. You can work into the, you know, move into the clinical side. You can work nursing, chief nursing officers, and then physicians. I think it's an area that has a lot of opportunities and functional areas that people can move to. Now, <clears throat> changing the subject, you have said that STEM blossoms <laughs> in your predictions, S-T-E-M. What 
exactly are you referring to? So STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And I use the analogy that like a flower that has a stem, it will continue to blossom and it will continue to fit job creation, particularly in the Bay Area as we know so well. So jobs and shortages are all related to computer programming, sci computer science, engineering, biological research, so you name it, if you have the interest and wherewithal, I encourage people to go into STEM because that's where the demand is, that's where the salaries are, that's where the opportunity is, and that's where the growth is. So how can we encourage uh, people to go into those areas? Because I, you know, I know very well what you're saying is very true, that we're you know, in um, short supply of certain skill sets. And yet, yeah. our kids are not necessarily you know, going into those fields. Yeah, so one, I'm a big fan of role modeling. I think kids are like sponges, and when they see people doing interesting things, it helps them connect the dots. So, for example, like gaming is very interesting to children. Helping them understand that in order to develop games, you'd have to understand computer programming, computer science. I think we also have to bring technology and use it ourselves with our kids, and I see that a lot in, here in the Bay Area. I don't see it so much outside of the Bay Area. And then exploration. You know, I, I meet so many parents that rotate their kids through a lot of different camps or experiences through the schools, music, gym, team sports, and technology. And, and it's, they view it as, uh, you know, as, as a language. So it's a language that their kids have to learn. It's not, you know, an, an extracurricular only activity. So I think you have to really encourage kids, use it, use it yourself, uh, and get involved with them. Now, how can we encourage uh, more girls and young women to get into these uh, technological fields? You know, I'm very excited because I read that Microsoft, I think Apple, I think Google are all coming out with these free programming uh, courses for young girls, for young kids. I was just at the Microsoft sh uh, store. They actually have free tech parties. Mm. The Girl Scouts were there the day I was there. Really? And they were uh, learning how to make videos. So I think you have to look around for resources, and a lot of it is free today, that we can just help our kids engage in at a young enough age that they can get excited about it because they're so fluent at that level. And even if we don't understand it, look for the resources. You know, between Apple and Microsoft, right here in Silicon Valley, there's so much. But all of, you know, Google, Facebook, a lot of, you know, we have the tech giants here that are, have a lot of outreach. Meetups, technical meetups. I see them all over the place involving parents and kids, you know, building everything from rockets to programming together to creating an app together. Hmm, that could be fun for some younger people, huh? I think so. I think it'd be very fun. My nephew is uh, get very excited about gaming, but then saw the opportunity in video. And his parents actually sent him to a computer video camp. Oh. It really resonated with him. And now he goes back and helps at the camp, works at the camp, and now is taking that path of video. Uh, and he didn't expect that, you know. And he was doing still, you know, other things that you do in school and, and team sports. But it was just that exposure that he got. And I think we have to do a lot of that when kids are young. Now, in, here in Silicon Valley, so many of our engineers come from China or India. Why do you think that is, that there's sometimes even a shortage of native-born American engineers? Yes, you know, from my experience and the reports that I read, there's just a, a much higher uh, emphasis at a, at a young age uh, that uh, science, technology, engineering, math is is an opportunity. It's, um, it's a way to, to create wealth for yourself. It's a way to create a better life for yourself and your kids. And there's a lot of emphasis at the early age on, on these subjects and um, the importance of getting jobs in these areas. So, you know, I always say that math is hard. Um, a lot of subjects are really hard, uh, but, you know, so what? You know, you gotta learn them. You know, you gotta, you gotta learn them, you gotta do it. Uh, and look at where the jobs are, help people connect the dots, you know. There's five million jobs open today and nine million people unemployed and it's not connecting. Right. What are those five million jobs? Right. And what do I need to do to get to those jobs? Right. And what can we do? 
to yeah. get to those jobs. Now, if, if you're in the workforce today, I encourage people, take advantage of your job, particularly if you're in the Bay Area, because people offer in-house technical training, usually for free, classes. There's always some sort of technology project or software or website or database getting implemented. That's the perfect time for you to get your hands wet, start to get the feel of, is there a technology that you migrate towards? Maybe it's social media, maybe it's data analysis, you know, maybe it's web design, but start to, to touch it and feel it and use the technology so that you can develop some skills. And also, uh, a lot of the companies actually offer free tuition, isn't that right? Yeah, or tuition reimbursement, reimbursement up to right. a particular uh, level, mm -hmm. guided by the laws. And yes, I would encourage, I mean, I took that path myself. Mm -hmm. I took a master's and doctorate through partnering with the companies that I work for, oh, great. who funded a good, significant part of my education. It's hard, you know, I'm not gonna tell anybody it's easy. It's very hard working all day, traveling in your job, yes. and then going to school on nights and weekends. Yes. But here's the good thing. I still had a social life and got married. You know, you all did. those bad things that people worry about will happen if you're working too hard and going to school. You know, it, it all sorts out. That is wonderful to hear. Yes, <laughs> 25 years, 25 years of additional education. And I, I do feel that education pays off. I think, you know, skills and experience are, are pretty critical. Problem solving and critical thinking. But also, education just keeps opening up the doors for more and more right. opportunities. And it's really how you use it mm -hmm. uh, to benefit yourself. So we have to instill that thought into the heads of our children, don't we? Yeah, because education keeps you learning on how to learn and continue to learn. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm a big fan of education. And if you can't afford it, there are other opportunities to get it. That's really good to hear. Well, Tracy, I think our time is up for today, and thank you again for being with us today. You're always so informative. Thank you, Grace, for having me as always. I hope you found our program informative today, and thank you for being with us. Remember to also watch our shows on YouTube and Roku. See you again next week on The Better Part. Bye-bye.